Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Find Your Model Health, the official podcast for those looking to optimize their long-term health and weight goals and understand how their body really works. I'm your host. I'm Shmay Lini. I'm a fitness and nutrition expert, certified iridologist, and biohacker. And I'm very excited to have Dr. Glenn Livingston back with us. If you didn't, check out our first interview, which was very popular before Christmas. Make sure you check that out. I believe it's episode 252. So Dr. Livingston, or Glenn, is a veteran psychologist, author of best-selling books, Never Binge Again, and 101 Best Food Rules. He's also co-founder of Never Binge Again, a company which specializes in helping people stop binge eating and overeating and lose weight and learn how to think like a permanently slimmer person on the diet and lifestyle of their choice. He has spent several decades researching the nature of binging and overeating with his own patients, which included a self-funded research program with more than 40,000 participants. So Glenn, Happy New Year. It's awesome. Happy New Year, Shemaine. It's so nice to see you. Thank you for having me back. Well, our last conversation was quite popular. It was actually a big hit, and it's no surprise because of the topic that it is. So I was excited that you agreed to come back. Believe it or not, one of the most um, uh, asked, well, not asked, when people listen to our last interview, the most feedback I got was how surprised people were that the food industry manipulates our food to encourage us to eat more of yeah. it. A lot of people yeah. didn't know that, which surprised me. I was like, I thought everyone knew that, but no, they didn't. They yeah. were surprised. So, yeah. Yeah, they they do. it Well, I mean, uh, we, we live in a capitalist economy and I'm, I'm in favor of that. But one negative side effect is that there really aren't a lot of watchdogs and regulations on, um, you know, optimizing for profit. And it's the company job to optimize for profit. And we're supposed to be a caveat emptor, um, mm -hmm. you know, buyer beware. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, they, they, they put things in some of the food to turn off the full sensors in our small intestines. And they, you know, they condense as many calories as they can in a small space without giving us the nutrition to feel satisfied. And um that's the impact. I look at look at the obesity epidemic, look at the heart disease epidemic, the diabetes epidemic, but look at what's happening. So mm. yeah, it's it's clear that we need a good defense because the, yeah. the government's not going to do anything soon. Yeah, there's pros and cons to having large governments. And of course, most people are in favor of capitalism, but not everybody has our best interests at heart, unfortunately. Right. And I don't think that the people there are evil. They, you know, if you took to the, when you talk to the people who work, whose job it is to, um, you know, to do this kind of thing, mm -hmm. they feel like their job is to make things that are fun, you know, just mm -hmm. like a, like a liquor company or a toy company or something like that. And, and they don't feel like it's their job to really watch out for the customer safety so much, except in the very short run. Mm -hmm. But, um, Anyway, I, I just I, I think I think still that's the way things are. And um but but the good news is that you can you can construct your own defenses with it. You can yeah. decide how you want to eat and effectively do that. Mm -hmm. Um it's gonna know a couple of things and create a couple of rules and have a way of managing your thinking and take good care of yourself and your nutrition and you'll be okay. Mm -hmm. So I do want to, towards then, maybe I want to touch a bit on choice and free will. But before we do that, since we last spoke, have you came across any new research or anything new on the whole binge eating, overeating world? I don't remember. I have to say exactly <laughs> what we talked about. So I don't I, okay. stop me if I'm repeating myself in some way. <laughs> um, the latest thing that we're focusing on has to do with operant conditioning which means that the thoughts that we have just before we eat tend to repeat themselves. And 
normally people don't pay attention to this. And as a consequence, the um, negative thinking and rationalization that leads to overeating tends to become strengthened. So for example, if you think, I'll just start tomorrow when you see a chocolate bar on the coffee counter, and then you eat the chocolate bar, um, assuming you had a rule that said I was not going to do that. Well, you've reinforced the notion that you can just start tomorrow, mm -hmm. um, which means that tomorrow you're going to be more likely to say just start tomorrow. So that thought's more likely to recur and you've made the craving stronger. Mm -hmm. But you can you can use that same phenomena to take control out of the thoughts and feelings of the thoughts and feelings that pop into your mind before you eat. So if there's a counter position, like um, I always use the present moment to be healthy, you you could create a mantra that you said every time before you ate. I always use the present moment to be healthy, and then boom, you eat, and now you're reinforcing that thought, and that thought becomes more prevalent and starts to crowd out the um, "I'll start tomorrow" thought. So lately, we're excited about the success we're having getting people to choose the way that they want to think in association with food um, and just consciously and purposely practicing that so that we reinforce that as opposed to the thoughts that get us to overeat. So that's operational conditioning. Is that what you call that? Uh, it's called operant conditioning, O-P-E-R-A-N-T, operant conditioning. So we it's, hadn't discussed that in our last one. We discussed a lot, but we did not discuss that. It's the same phenomenon that um, I used to teach my dog how to sneeze for cheese <laughs> when, when, when I was um, in my 30s. I had this 125 pound Doberman Pinscher. I'll send you a picture if you're curious. He was great. Yeah. Um, did all kinds of types of fun things. And one day I was standing by the refrigerator. This was before I was a vegan. And um, I was eating some cheese, eating like these slices of cheese. And he happens to walk by the refrigerator and he accidentally sneezed. And I just happened to have a piece of cheese in my hand and I gave him a piece of cheese. Well, he thinks for a second, he looks at me and he goes, he sneezes again. And so I gave him another piece of cheese because <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a sick bastard. And then after that, every time that he saw me by the refrigerator, he'd run up and sneeze for cheese. Uh, it's just it's just the same phenomenon. We, yeah. we tend to repeat what succeeds for us. Mm. Um, operant conditioning yeah. yeah so something so that would be something as simple as creating a mantra before you go to put something in your mouth like i have the power of choice here or this is my <laughs> opportunity to whatever <laughs> if, if every moment is an opportunity for self-love or self-harm that's another mantra you could say mm. if, I, if, I, I like if, simple if, things like this choice is mine because everything is a choice Mm -hmm. um, even though we don't think it is when when tiredness and lack of willpower take over mm -hmm. yeah. so i over the last couple of weeks i've done a couple of interviews with um trauma healers and trauma specialists and i know we kind of touched on in the first one um your experience when you were a one-year-old with your sugar box and your mom sending you to get that and all of course traumatic but there's a lot of talk about trauma now like it's a hot topic you see every couple of years we go through these trends of hot topics mm -hmm. uh and yes it has validation but i'm curious what you think about this whole talk of trauma now in regards to people struggling to prioritize themselves and stay on track with their health and weight goals and it's just a lot of talk about let's dig into your trauma and analyze that first before you even take action kind of thing well i think that's kind of um trying to figure out how to say this without cursing I, 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 well, I, I think it's a little back ass words mm -hmm. um, because I, I, I am in favor of understanding your trauma and, you know, being loving to yourself and understanding that we all have trauma that we have to heal. I'm very much in favor of that. But I, I think that it's a mistake to wait until that trauma is analyzed and verbalized and healed before you take action on the behaviors that are um, quote unquote protecting you from, from the trauma. I, I think that 
trauma can be the spark that lights the fire but you know once the fire is lit there's a it's got a life of its own and um and essentially there's a bad habit that develops and it's that habit that needs to be broken regardless of what caused it in the first place um, i also think like in the case of overeating if you're continuing to overeat with the idea that you need to analyze your traumas first you might never get to the traumas. You might never really be able to fully articulate it because the nervous system has trouble conducting the emotions when the digestive system is overloaded with food. Um, and so you wind up in this endless loop where you're trying to articulate the trauma, but you can never really feel the full experience associated with the trauma because you keep covering it over. Um, so you don't really get to the trauma until you stop the overeating. And there are also a number of other factors that maintain overeating. There's the pleasure of the overeating itself, you know, the concentrated sources of calories and excitotoxins in the food that we eat, those bags and boxes and containers. Um, so that there's that in and of itself. There's the fact that feelings are reinforced and amplified by you know, sugary, starchy, um, treaty type foods. Mm -hmm. So whatever the bad feeling is that you're trying to escape from, you actually might be reinforcing it by, you know, having those bags of Doritos or chocolate bars or pizza or pasta or whatever it is that you're, you're binging on. Mm -hmm. um, so it really just complicates the whole matter. And I find that if you clear away the muck of the, you know, behavioral, um the behavioral problems then it's it's a lot safer to look at the fire in the fireplace and it's a lot easier to articulate what the problem is and to you know put out the fire if that's what you need to do but i don't think you have to or should you put out the fire before you build a better fireplace and prevent it from burning down the house mm, so that's potentially if you put out the fire first you have one less battle to fight while you're fighting this trauma about yeah but, exactly i mean i can see both sides of the argument um my personality has me neither here nor there on it from my point of view i do see it's important to address trauma but i do see it can give people this sense of justification in their choices then oh look i've uncovered this traumatic event blah 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 i'm working with it with a therapist but because i'm going through this now i am allowed to have this cake or ice cream like i need this right like there's that justification aspect which mm -hmm. concerns me mm -hmm. me too me too but we clearly already have an epidemic that just keeps getting worse and worse and worse i always come back to the analogy of 10 years ago before keto and all really took off and paleo and all these miracle protocols took off, we were at our heaviest then and most unhealthiest. 10 years later, we have done all of this and now we're at our heaviest and unhealthy. Like something is not working here. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, people still clutch at straws. On our first phone call, you spoke about, because you apparently love fire analogies, you spoke about the fireplace and emotions and severing the link between emotions and emotional eatings. If you can recall that analogy, could you go over that again? Well, yeah, it's, it's basically what we just talked about. Most people think, so here's the fire. I'm doing a little fire thing with my hands. Uh, most people think when the fire is burning, it's gonna go and burn down the house, right? But the truth is that there's a fireplace and the fire is burning, there has to be a hole in the fireplace for the fire to get through to come burn down the house. And if you can fix the fireplace, then it's much harder for the fire to burn down the house. The um, the fireplace in this analogy is the, um, the part of your identity that keeps you following the rules in your own best thinking. Like if, even if people don't have written rules that they want to follow, they kind of have a code of behavior that they think of as think of themselves like I'm you know I'm someone who only eats chocolate on the weekend or I'm someone that um you know I make up for my workouts but I don't overdo it after my workout um and 
then there's this voice in our head. So he here's the fireplace, the fire can't get through. But then there's this voice in their head that says, oh, come on, a little is not going to hurt. You worked out hard enough, right? Mm -hmm. And there's this hole in the fireplace. And so all I'm saying is fix the holes in the fireplace and keep the fire in the fireplace. This is the first time I did this little, oh, no, I think I like this now. Okay. <laughs> that's your new thing. Okay. So mm -hmm. that's more talking on fix the hole, basically fix your self-control and your discipline. That is that aspect of being hard on yourself because sometimes you have to be hard on yourself which will touch on the like rules and bright lines and you've you mentioned before how having rules and bright lines I'm a big believer in rules a big believer in structure I think humans especially women work very well off having structure in their day and being told specifically what to do so yes they'll stray but most of the time giving them specific rules is going to be very helpful I have specific rules one example of mine this might be crazy to you but I am in bed by 8 30 a.m I read my book for 30 or 20 minutes and then my head's on the pillow by nine that's mm -hmm. my bright line that's my rule I don't ever sway from that once in the blue moon maybe on like a Saturday or something but otherwise that is my rule and the driving factor behind that rule is because I have to show up the next day and perform not just for myself but for other people as well so there's <laughs> but that's my rule a lot of people don't like having rules they don't like having right lines they I believe they have it in their head that I don't like being told what to do and mm -hmm. sometimes that's just tough. You have to be because whatever else you're doing is not working. Um, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I think there's a, there are a lot of reasons why rules work better than guidelines in most circumstances. Um, for, first of all, the system that we've developed, nobody's going to tell you what to do. You're going to tell yourself what to do um, because just because people get, tend to get a lot more rebellious against other people's rules than they do against their own rules. However, we are very big proponents of having those rules and structure, because if you don't know what you're aiming for, you're probably going to hit something else. Like if, if you're not aiming for a very specific bullseye in the archery target, then how are you going to know by how much and in what direction did you miss when you missed it? And so how do you know what adjustments to make? You're you're eliminating that feedback loop. And that's why most people cycle down with their eating is that they they can't adjust after a mistake in the right way because they're so frightened of the discipline and the rules in the first place. Um, I've the, the availability of rules to you is a way to eliminate decision fatigue. If I know that I only have chocolate on Saturdays and Sundays and no more than two ounces and always, you know, 70% dark chocolate or something like mm -hmm. that, then all of my other chocolate decisions are made during the week. And every time I'm in front of a chocolate bar, I don't have to make another food decision. So I'm not constantly wearing down my willpower. You can think of willpower as the ability to make good decisions. And there are only so many good decisions people can make over the course of a day. So it's better to say, if you want to have chocolate 10% of the time, rather than saying, well, I'm going to indulge 10% of the time and be good 90% of the time, which doesn't tell you which is the 10% and the 9%. So you have to make those decisions all the time. It would be, it would be better to say, I'm only going to have chocolate in the last three days of the calendar month. That, that would be your 10%. And then for the vast majority of the month, your food decisions would have been made about chocolate and you don't have to wear down your willpower, wear down your willpower, wear down your willpower, wear down your willpower. Um, I think that people are also frightened of rules because they feel like um, rules are a, like discipline is opposed to freedom. Like the more discipline you have, the less freedom you have, but it's actually the opposite. If you don't know the rules of the road, you can't drive and your radius of locomotion is gonna contract dramatically, right? If it wasn't for the discipline of the engineers who put your car together, your steering wheel wouldn't turn exactly, your your wheels wouldn't turn exactly 30 degrees when you turned your steering wheel 30 degrees. And you really wouldn't be able to, to get around. Um, jazz musicians seem like they're improvising their soul with much greater freedom than, than most of us have. But 
they can only do that because they've practiced the scales with discipline and they know the structure of music. So they're able to improvise away from it. So most of the freedoms that we value and enjoy in our life actually are built on top of discipline, not, not as opposed to discipline itself. Um, the last thing I'll say is that I think people have rules in, even if they don't think that they have rules, because um, if you think of character as how you habitually respond in the moment of temptation, there are many moments of temptation where we've learned to habitually respond a certain way because of the kind of person we think of ourselves as. Like if you go into a, a diner and there's a $20 bill on the counter um, and the waitress sits you down and she hasn't seen her tip yet. And she says, I'll be, I'll be right back. I'm just going to go get you a menu. And there's nobody that would see you take it. There's nobody up front. Um, would you take that $20 bill? Virtually everybody says, no, I wouldn't mm -hmm. because I'm not a thief. Well, what, what is it to say that I'm not a thief, but to say, I will never steal, right? Mm -hmm. That's not mine. So you have a rule. You just haven't articulated that rule. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm in favor of people articulating the codes of behavior that they want to follow so that they can build the character that they, they want to build. I was hoping you would touch on that. And that's why I smiled. I was like, yes, he's touching on this. So rules and free will to put this, just to clarify this a bit more for my clients and my followers, what you're saying or alluding to is that when we have these rules around food, it's not that it gives us more freedom with food. It gives more freedom on the emotional aspect and the character and who we want to be. Uh -huh. That's where the freedom and neither of us are saying totally eliminate everything forever. We're more talking about you have to have the balance and a realistic talk with yourself. But that's what you mean. Rules around food actually give you more with free will around other choices. They give you more free will around other choices. They leave your willpower for more important decisions. Um, they, but they also make it possible to enjoy your food at a much deeper creative level, a deeper, more profound level. Because, look, I, I only have three rules right now. But the fact that I know that they're there and that I'm not going to cross those lines means that everything else that I eat, I can do with gusto and enjoyment. And I think we're meant to have gusto and enjoyment with our food. The fact that I know the rules of the road means that while I'm driving, I could listen to music or daydream or talk to my friends or um, even just sit quietly. Daydream. And I daydream a little bit, but I, you know, you're, you're, you're in a state of suspended attention. Your yeah. things yeah. pass through your periphery and you're aware of it, but you're not afraid that there's going to be another car coming barreling the other way or that you're not going to stop at a red light because you know what to do at a red light. You have that rule, you reflexively do it, and that's that. Mm -hmm. So, so um, I think it makes it possible to enjoy food without guilt when you know that your previously dangerous um, food situations are all covered by well-defined decisions that you've made beforehand. Um, you can just kind of enjoy the food that you do eat otherwise. So I, I, and when there are no decisions to make, the obsession about food goes away. Mm. When, when you're not thinking, how much should I have? And when will I have it? And how do I get away with it? And how do I make up for it? And how do I hide the evidence? And how much weight am I going to gain? And will anybody be able to, when you're not thinking about all that, then you can find peace with food. Um, it's just, you know, it's peace between the lines. It's peace mm -hmm. between the lines, that's all. And I, I think it's a much better trade-off than I'm going to eat whatever the F I want to. And there's it's it's bad to make lines between good foods and bad foods or good food behaviors and bad food behaviors. Um, I'm actually of the opposite camp. I think there's more freedom in um, in defining how you want to be and pursuing the exact person that you want to be rather than letting food rule over you. I'm going to eat whatever I feel like at the moment, you're kind of putting yourself at the mercy of these big food companies and, you know, anybody that wants to push your evolutionary buttons, um, mm. you're dedicating your life energy to them rather than to, to yourself. And That's you just feel, yeah, you just feel terrible. If food, food controls you and you constantly give in to this food and temptation all the time, 
without having strict rules and bright lines, you end up feel, feeling rubbish because you're constantly kicking yourself. You constantly have that self guilt. Why can't I stay on track? Why can't I do this? Blah, blah, blah. So there, it's a horrible, vicious cycle. And Shemaine, Sh also, it doesn't have to be a strict rule. It, it, it's, it's a definite rule. It, mm -hmm. it could be, I always put my fork down between bites. Yeah. Or I always take a picture of my food before eating. It could just be something that puts a space between stimulus and response so that you're eating more mindfully. Uh, and some people do fine only with those type of mindful rules and not necessarily having to regulate a particular food. Other people, you know, need to regulate a particular food. I, I don't need chocolate. I don't need sugar. Um, some people have to regulate that. I do feel I do feel there is real value in having rules, even if they're not through any sort of rules. I'm the type of person that does this and I don't do this because we do need boundaries. Although people don't like this kind of yes, no scenario, coming back to looking at society now, we clearly need some help and maybe we, we, we could use some help. We yeah. could, we could we, use some help. This, yeah. This this dare I say harder approach which I'm okay with because I think some people need it we spoke about that before it's not always good to wrap people in cotton wool sometimes people do need a kick up the ass um an empathetic kick up the ass <laughs> so uh, an, an iron fist in a velvet glove an yeah. iron fist in a velvet glove yeah and people do need that they might not like it but they needed, um, and I just want to translate, correct me if I'm wrong, please do correct me if I'm wrong, but back to the food free will enjoyment, I teach my clients a lot about refeeding and refeed meals, and I even do reverse dieting and the value behind these tools, but one of the important aspects of doing something like that is um, really understanding if you are going to have a refeed meal, you need to earn it. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to have a refeed meal. You need to earn it so that when you do have that refeed meal, you thoroughly enjoy it. You don't have that guilt. You don't have to second guess the menu. Oh, I'm going to choose the salad because I'm supposed to be healthy. Like you have that freedom. You know, you've earned it. So I think you were alluding to that aspect as well. If you go out to eat or there's a family event, if you know you've worked hard, you've earned this kind of bit of flexibility and that's freeing in itself. Very much so. And Very then the so. health food aspect, I think in, in choosing like healthy food during the week or whenever the other 80, 90% of the time is, I think that's where people find more of the challenge in order for that to be freeing, for you to have that realization, like this is my, I'm choosing this food because I want to choose it because I want to be this type of person. I want to see these type of results. I think that's more challenging because that's more of habitual wash, rinse, repeat, hot, wash, rinse, repeat, and um, creating habits so is the, not as easy. I want to say two things about that. The First of all, you don't want the swings to be too great. So even though you, know, you could have a couple of hundred calories less during the week and then have a big meal on the weekend as a refeed meal, um, you don't want to have like a thousand calories less every day during the week and then have, you know, a 10,000 calorie day on Saturday. Uh, there, there is this, um, seems to be this feast and famine switch in the brain, which says, if I live in an environment which is very scarce in calories and nutrition, as soon as it's available, then I really have to hoard it. Yeah. And that's that seems to be part of what's behind binge eating. We've worked with over 2,000 people and we've observed this very consistently. In order to overcome serious overeating, you really need to flood your body with nutrition on a regular basis at a slight deficit if you want to lose weight. So slowly, 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 slowly come down. Um, what's the other thing that I wanted to say? Um, oh, I forgot. I'm sorry. Hey, welcome back. I, I, I just kept thinking you're, you, yeah, like you, you probably do kick a lot of people's asses. <laughs> that's, what was, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> well, I did a video. What you just said there, I did a master class last week on body fat set point, helping people mm -hmm. understand what you're alluding to. And I think we spoke about this in the first one, the leptin hormone and how if you do have these huge calorie deficits every day, and it's even extreme and long term the body's going to try push back and restore those leptin hormones to their levels. And that's where you start eating. And even though you know what you should have, 
all of a sudden it's uncontrollable and you can't stop. No matter how much your brain says you want to stop, it's uncontrollable. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there it's important. You said slow, slow, slow. And all I was thinking was, God, my clients hate to hear that. They I know my, my, my clients, they hate to hear that also, but the, the fastest way to lose weight is slowly because if you keep going on that roller coaster, the roll, it doesn't go back to the same point every time. It actually goes up and up and up and up. Yeah. Um, people just gain weight when they do that. So you, you got to get off that feast and famine cycle. Oh, the other thing I was going to say was that the more you gravitate towards whole foods and the less processed foods you include in your diet, the more you're going to want whole foods and the less you're going to want the processed foods. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of the things that we're eating that are causing the problem are, are unnatural and they cause down, down regulation of your taste buds. When you, if you had a chocolate bar every day after a while, an apple doesn't taste as sweet. And this is why people start to say they don't like fruit and vegetables. And everybody knows you have to eat more fruit and vegetables if you want to lose weight. Um, however, if you rarely have the chocolate bar, your taste buds will start to come back and you'll be able to tell the difference in you know, the subtle flavors of a Fuji apple versus a delicious apple or you know, even romaine lettuce versus arugula. Mm. Um, eventually, you don't have to believe me. You just have to, you just got to try it. Um, so you got to give your taste buds time to you know, come back. I think there's research that they double in sensitivity over about eight weeks if you get rid of all the processed junk. So um, the, your inner food monster will say you're going to be tortured forever. You're going to feel deprived forever. But it's, it's really not true. We adjust. And there is research that says that no matter what diet people are on, two years later, they're going to tell you that they love it. And they're going to try to get everybody else to to eat that diet, which tells us that our pleasure systems are malleable, mm. that we're, we're designed to affix pleasure to wherever the resources are um, that are available in the environment. So we're, so it's, it's not like the only thing you can possibly enjoy is that chocolate bar. It's that you've taught your brain that the chocolate bar is where the resources are in this environment. And so it's reluctant to give that up. But if those resources were to suddenly become unavailable and you had an apple every day instead of the chocolate bar, eventually you're going to crave the apple as much as you crave the chocolate. Not immediately. Immediately you're going to say this is BS and who's doing this, but um, yeah. eventually you're going to, you're going to crave the chocolate more than the, the um, apple um, even more I so. so. I'm so glad you touched on that. And for all of my clients watching, I did not pay Glenn to say any of this. <laughs> yeah. so I constantly say to when I start new clients or a new program or something and introduce certain foods, uh, there's always that bit of, oh, this is gross. I don't want to do this. And a lot of the time I'll say, stop being a baby. These are grown women. <laughs> but... I'm always saying, you know, your your taste buds turn over every three days. So give this time and you will adapt and you will learn to enjoy the 80% dark chocolate or black coffee or whatever it is. You will. So then I have to usually follow that up with, please trust me. I've done this a lot. Please just trust yep. me. But it's true. And a lot of people, I said this to someone this morning, actually, and I swear I didn't tell you to say this. Um, we have taste buds all over our body. And when most people hear about taste buds, they think it's in your mouth. We actually have a lot of taste buds on our liver, which when we start to consider like insulin resistance and the cephalic phase of digestion, not to get too sciencey, but sweet tastes and how they can encourage cravings, even natural sweeteners. I know the research is is still up in the air, but the taste alone hitting your taste buds, not just in your mouth, but on your liver can cause an insulin response for people and encourage them to crave more sugar or whatever. Mm. A mm. lot of people don't get this. So yeah, we can, our taste buds do change, but um, it, I'm glad you reinforced that because sometimes people don't believe me and they think, oh, she's full of shit. She's just saying this when I'm not. <laughs> good, good, good deal. So I wanted to ask you before we start to wrap up, um, and you did mention this in the last interview, but not too much. Just I, I think this is kind of a raw, raw and bold topic to cover was um, food addiction and its resemblance to drug addiction. Mm -hmm. so can we talk on that a little bit? Oh, well, I mean, so that there 
there are differences between them in as much as we don't really have prisons for food addicts. You're not going to wake up in a cell with four gray walls and, you know, your new husband, Booba, who um, says that you're in there for having too many donuts. It, it just doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, and so I think that food addicts tend to be a little less antisocial and, you know, drug addicts are more likely to get behind the wheel of a car or do something illegal for their, for their drugs. Um, and the aspect of the survival drive that, drug addiction is tied to can be um, more primitive and urgent than the survival drive associated with food. So for example, crack addicts, it's really a, a biological error associated with breathing. Crack ad addicts, they'll, they'll call their drug their sweet oxygen. Mm -hmm. And they'll, they'll, I mean, they'll kill you to get at the crack. And they really believe that they need that, they'll kill you to get at the crack. We have jokes like just hand over the chocolate and nobody gets hurt. But yeah. really, when's the last time when someone kill, someone kills you for a chocolate bar, right? So there's that difference. And there's the difference that, um, by the way, I'm having trouble seeing your face because of the sun. Um, thank you. There, There's the difference that drugs are something you and alcohol is something you can quit cold turkey. It's a black and white addiction. But mm -hmm. food is something you have to take the line out of the cage three times a day and walk it around the block. Right. Mm -hmm. So oh, in some ways, it's more complex to give up um, food addiction than it is to give up drug addictions. The black and white line that I draw for food addicts is that food addiction is the addiction to making important food decisions on whim, um, impulse or emotion rather than with your intellect. So if you move all your important food decisions to your intellect, that's how you recover from from food addiction. Um those are the differences. I just wanted to make sure they were sure they were outlined. The similarity is that they both involve, um, you know, the dopaminergic pleasure response. Um, they both involve a serious alteration, like, like an unnatural concentration of dopaminergic pleasure, followed by a crash, uh, where you're artificially low in dopamine and therefore craving, craving more. Um, they both involve an activation of the reptilian brain you know the the fast thinking emergency action brain rather than the slow thinking to quote daniel hahnemann's uh, uh, terminology the the slow thinking rational uh, strategic brain um, and overcoming both of them involves learning how to um, deactivate the reptilian brain and put yourself back in your right mind and, mm -hmm. and make the right decision um, and they both tend to develop a quality of automaticity where eventually people feel as if they're powerless to stop it. If they feel like it just kind of happens to them, it's not really true. There's always an opportunity to put a space between stimulus and response and make a different choice. But um, it really can feel with every bone in your body that you can't make another choice. Um, and so in both cases, people need to learn that feelings aren't facts and that they they are agents of free will and responsibility and they're capable of taking control again, which is heresy to say, heresy to say in some circles. Um, it's very common to think of addiction as a disease and that people are powerless to do anything about it. And, you know, we, we should... Um, it's it's the difference between treating people or punishing people for for crimes regarding addiction um but um i i still think that it's even though saying that it's a disease seems more compassionate i i actually think it's um demeaning to the person it's a very low view of human nature it, it says we can't do anything about our choices the devil made us do it the devil made us do it and you can accept that and assuage yourself of guilt and personal responsibility, but you've also, in the process, um, a, a, a abdicated free will and you no know, control over your own life. And you've put yourself in a position where you're going to feel progressively more frightened of your own body and out of control of your life. Um, so I, I think that's a bad idea. I think it's better to hold fast to the notion of free will and responsibility, make some rules, except this is, this is hard. It's mm -hmm. a, it's a big mountain to climb. Um, you know, and, and if you do make a mistake, well, if you do make a mistake with food, it's important to forgive yourself 
you know, with dignity and analyze what happened and get up and aim at the bullseye again. It's also important to do that with drug and alcohol addiction. However, because with drug and alcohol addiction, people are prone to maim or kill or mutilate other people. Um, you can't really be as soft on the mistake. You can't say, well, I made a mistake. Oh, well, you know, you really have, it has to be taken extraordinarily seriously. So it, yeah, I don't know if that's have, answering you. Go on. Yeah, they have their differences, but at the same time, similarities when we're looking for that hit, just have how extreme we're going to go to achieve the hit. That's where they're quite different. And like you said, you can, if you decide you're going to go cold turkey on alcohol or crack, you can avoid it. But with food, you can't avoid it. You have to eat. It's there three times a day or five times a day, depending on how many times you eat. So the challenge is harder because then the onus is on you. It's not that you just go and cold turkey. That responsibility is on you to make the choice and continue to do that while having faith that the more I do this, the easier it's going to get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have famous last words from you right there, I think, where um, you have to take responsibility. This is quite a mountain and it's going to be hard. It's going to be very hard, but that's where we have to, to some extent, be hard on ourselves because being soft has not gotten us very far. You need like a superhero's costume or something that's... Um you know, showed you as a food ass kicker or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I told you in the last one, I was 280 pounds uh, and then I lost 165. So I hit my goal weight oh, many years ago, 2008. But it's been, it's been, a, a, it's not a mountain so much anymore as it is a very long flat road through Texas or something in the scorching heat. It's just, it's constantly a challenge all day, every day, because Although you get stronger, the more you do it, these food temptations are still here. The tastes are still there. The challenge, I too get tired. I too burn out of my willpower and decision-making capabilities. It's con But there's that resilient aspect of my personality that forces me to say to, I literally say to myself, stop your shit just go do it like i don't want to go to the gym <laughs> some days but i'm like just let me do it like it's it's not easy it, it's it's not it doesn't matter who you are this is not easy sometime i want to try to coach you through uh one or two of your difficult spots i bet there are some things we can do it i agree with you um we're in a we live in a world of temptation but i also have discovered some way to make it easier uh, it's it's hardest in the first couple of months. The, mm -hmm. the real the real struggle is the first couple of months. But I I will bet you if you choose your most difficult uh, temptation, that I can make it easier for you, I, if you're willing to take that bet. So yeah, I was totally you, well. <laughs> right now, I try to eat eat the frog, which is usually my workout. I'll get Brian Tra Brian tomorrow. Tracy. Yeah, yeah. Brian Tracy. I try. Yeah. I keep saying eat the frog, and then my other that other voice on this shoulder says. No, you don't like frogs. You're not French. You don't have to eat them frogs. <laughs> and I have this internal conflict. Usually my biggest challenge is, I think, like most women, is towards the end of the day, that fatigue kicks in, the willpower is low. I'm pretty, pretty good at staying on track, but the challenge is still there. I still have to have that inner talk. I have to have these rules. I have to have these bright lines all the time. But uh, I, 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 simp a simple thing you can do, they're, they're there's a little coaching procedure I could take you through to fix that, but a simple, not to 100% fix it to make it a lot easier. Um, a simple thing you can do is make your food decisions in the morning and have it all set up and waiting for you. So put together whatever meal you're going to have at four o'clock and have it in your Tupperware or take it with you in the car and do that in the morning when your willpower is at its strongest. That's, mm -hmm. um, that's a simple yeah. fix for that. It yeah. is. I think not to, that is very valuable, but with me and I don't know how, I, I would think a lot of people who are at their maintenance, like I am, I have this inner talk of if I do give in to temptation, oh, it's okay. I know what I'm doing. I know how to undo this. I'm a health coach. I'm at my maintenance. Like there's that kind of cop out aspect of, oh, sure, I'm exempt. I know how to undo any damage this might cause. I don't do it very often, but when I do do it, I know that voice is there is like, 
I know what I'm doing. I'll fix this tomorrow. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. like, I'm only kidding myself yeah. though, but yeah. Okay. Well, Glenn, last thing, uh, I gave away your workbook. We spoke about your workbook on the last interview. So I got a few of them for my Christmas giveaway and I gave them away to clients. But when they arrived, I was like, it was like that thick. And I was like, oh my God, you could kill someone with this book. I didn't expect it to be that big. It was like, that's a lot of work to be doing. Do you? <laughs> well, but part, part of the reason for that, I don't know how much you looked inside of it, but it but is. there are certain exercises that are meant to be repeated, you know, a dozen times or so. And so we made sure to put, um, for, for example, when you are struggling with a particular rationalization, like, uh, you, your inner pig says, we know what we're doing. We can make up for this tomorrow. Yeah. Um, you might have to refute that 10 or 12 times to really get that under control. So we set it up so that there's space for you to to do that. That's that's a lot of reason why it's a little bigger or thicker. I mean, there's a lot in there otherwise. And, and I won't say that it's not a lot of work, but um, it's not as much as some people might be scared it is from the way you just described it. The, <laughs> well, the, book, look, is called, the book is called I Love My Workbook, by the way. Yeah, it, and it is awesome. I did look at it. That was one of my questions. I mean, even if someone doesn't complete it, should someone break into your house, you could potentially kill someone with it. That's how big it is. <laughs> but is there, I wanted to ask, and I swear this is our last question. With the workbook, do you, what way would you recommend approaching it? Do you just go front to back page or hop around, follow the context as you need it? Like, is there- No, no, it's, it, it's designed to go front to back. Okay. It's, 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 it's a very logical system that you're, um, you're identifying the most difficult food behaviors and you're coming up with one simple rule to start. And then you're building very slowly from there. And as you're building, you're looking at the resistance that you feel to doing it and then overcoming that resistance little by little. So it's, it's an algorithm. It really does go from start to finish. So it's better okay. to do that. And there's no rush. If you, mm -hmm get through the first chapter or two you'll probably find there's a big difference and then you can go at your own pace yeah so i i'd like put a put, I put like an, an hour or two aside for two days in a row um and then i go at my own pace yeah and for anyone wondering i found in canada here the easiest place to get it is on amazon and then delivered right to your door it's a bit harder to get in our bookstores but amazon has a lot of it so we, we never really focused on bookstores we, we really focused on the the Amazon and digital marketing. Yeah. So that, oh. That'll be, that'll be a next phase. Yeah. Would you have any last minute words of motivation or wisdom for us going into this new year or continuing into this year? Um, you can't until you can, you can't until you can. Most people feel disempowered and hopeless about this. And the research shows that the people who lose weight and keep it off for five years or more, have more failures behind them than the people who yo-yo diet. Mm. And so the path to success, the path of success seems to go through repeated failure. And so the name of the game is staying in the game until you win the game. Collect evidence of success. Um, get up until you stay up. So think about an infant learning how to walk. They mm. fall down, they get up, they fall down, they get up, they fall down, they get up, and eventually they stay up. Yeah. yeah and I haven't I haven't fallen down in, you know. 50, 50 years or so. <laughs> it's a little more, little more than that. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. I really enjoy our talks. I really do. This was another Me great too. one. I'm sure people are going to um, enjoy this. So I will post your links, but please share where people can find you and more about your work. It's all at neverbingeagain.com. Mm -hmm. Neverbingeagain.com. Click the big red button. You get a free copy of the main book. Um, if you already have that, you can go to neverbingeagainbooks.com and get the other books. Those aren't free. Um, but they're available. There's a book on nighttime eating. There's a book on specific binge triggers. Um, there, there are. There, I wrote an autobiography about my own experience with food. Um, so if you're kind of into it and you want to know more, you can do that. But it, you really should go to neverbingeagain.com and click the big red button because you'll also get um, a set of, when you sign up for the reader bonus, bonus list, you'll get a set of food plan templates, food plan starter templates. So for any dietary philosophy, you'll find something that matches you. You'll get a set of recorded coaching sessions so you know um, what it's like to actually be coached through this process and not just hear this weird psychologist with a pig inside of him talking to Shemaine. <laughs> and and um, 
it's, it's all at nevermentionedagain.com. Click the big red button. That's what I would do. Awesome. Great. That's a lot of free content. People will find that very helpful. Well, Glenn, thank you for your time. It's been thank a you. pleasure. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And we'll hopefully speak to you again soon. Okay. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye.